This week, a lecture about the Mexican-American War during the late 1840s. Professor John Pinaro of Aquinas College examined the political causes of the war and its impact on the following 20 years. So the Americans start looking at these sparsely populated lands and see the potential for agriculture and mining and that's going to figure into the manifest destiny sentiment that these lands ought to just become U.S. territory. That the Americans would use the land better than the Mexicans were using it. And not only that, they were ordained by divine providence to, to do so. More with Aquinas College professor John Pinaro after this. We're going to cover the Mexican-American War today. Uh, this is a war a lot of Americans... I think they know very little about it. It's considered one of the more embarrassing wars in American history, and there's reasons sometimes Americans don't like to talk about it. Uh, my own mother, even though I've lectured on the Mexican-American War for years and written a couple books about it, still thinks I studied the Spanish-American War sometimes. And, uh, but we cleared up that confusion actually a, a few years back. Uh, so what I'm going to do is not take us through battle by battle in the war, but look mainly at the, the causes of the war, and then a little bit about the war itself, and then the consequences. But I, I kind of want to cover a, a big summary right up front and say then, so this war was in the 1840s, and it was consequential for, for both countries, and the cause lay in disputed territory and uh, uh, down in, in Texas, and that's where American and Mexican troops clashed in April of 1846. And two years later, the Mexican session, the session that was part of the treaty ending the war, gave to the United States Alta California, or the modern state of California, and New Mexico. But New Mexico was much larger than the, the modern state of New Mexico. So it included Nevada and New Mexico and Utah and most of Arizona, and parts of Wyoming, and parts of Colorado. So that's about, a, that's about a third of Mexico, this area. So we'll look at that. We'll look something at that area first. But to do a little bit of background, let's talk about Andrew Jackson. That's a presidential, presidential portrait of, of Andrew Jackson, an illustration. Talk a little bit about Jacksonian democracy. So we haven't talked about Jacksonian democracy much yet. We're kind of coming out of the era of good feelings, and we talked about the market revolution. But Jackson, when he was elected president, he had won the popular vote in 1824, but lost the presidency in the Electoral College and in the, the House of Representatives. And so he ran for office, in a sense, for four years in the name of democracy and popular democracy. Jackson was the first populist president in American history. And he imagined himself as a, as a Jeffersonian in favor of the yeoman farmers and in favor of liberty. But he's quite a bit different than Jefferson, and Jefferson thought he was a little wacky, I think. So Jackson thought that it wasn't the House of Representatives that was the most democratic branch of the American government. It was actually the executive branch, even though the executive is one person. And his, his argument was that the president's the only person in the U.S. government, elected by all the people. Congressmen are elected by districts. The Supreme Court is appointed. The senators were appointed by state legislatures in those days. So this was his, his uh, principle of governing. The majority is to govern. So majority rule, in other words. Numbers matter a lot to, to Jackson. So if the majority wants something, they're going to get it. So in the name of democracy, for instance, if you've, got a, if you've got a lot of Americans hungry for land and want to be yeoman farmers or maybe want to be planters uh, in the South, then it's going to be Jackson who, in the name of the majority, is going to sign Indian removal treaties and forcibly remove Indians from the, the Southeast because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of land there for those yeoman farmers. If Americans think the Bank of the United States is an elitist institution and not good for democracy then he's going to destroy the Bank of the United States even if it hasn't expired yet under the law. If he thinks the majority don't like the U.S. government funding internal improvements like roads and bridges, he's going to uh, veto those bills. So these are the kinds of things he's going to do in the name of, of the majority. And I want to say that I think, uh, I think promoting within his party this kind of view is going to help lead to the Mexican-American War. I think it's the, the fruit of this kind of majoritarian democracy. So one of his early critics was Winfield Scott, who ends up being probably the most important general and at least the best military mind uh, in, in 
the early to mid 19th century in the United States. Winfield Scott later is the one who came up with the Anaconda Plan for, for the Civil War, for the Union side. Winfield Scott also uh, is going to come up with the, the amphibious landing and invasion of central Mexico during this war. He also, though, happened to be a member of the opposition political party, the Whig Party. And some more on that later, but Scott thought early on, as he calls it here, demagogues broke the Constitution early in the times of Jacksonism. Jacksonian democracy for Scott was, was an ideology, okay, this, this belief that somehow numbers know best, that minority interests don't matter. That means 51% barely. The 51 can run over the 49, uh, in other words. So Jackson's first principle then was, was about executive power, claiming that for democracy. When he, had, when he had opponents, when they finally coalesced into another party to oppose his Democratic Party, they called themselves the Whig Party. Do you remember Edmund Burke, the Whig? Burke's party? How do we describe the Whig Party? A Burke? They're the constitutional monarchy party, anti-monarchy. So they're, they're act, by taking the name Whig Party, Jackson's opponents said he's more like King Andrew than a Democrat. He might say he's doing it in the name of the people, but the way he rules, the way he rules is more like a king. So when the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional for Georgia to extend its laws over Cherokee territory, Jackson said, I, I don't care. The Supreme Court has no way to enforce that. And Georgia just went ahead, and then Jackson went ahead, uh, with, with Indian removal. Jackson, it was under Jackson that in 1827, the Democratic Republican Party, the only party left really after the War of 1812, renamed itself the Democratic Party. And they're the, they're the agricultural party, they're the party of the yeoman farmer. We talked about some of this stuff last time with the, with the market revolution. So these are the people more nervous about those market revolution changes, and they're in the Democratic Party. Jackson's, its, its figurehead at least, his protege was a man from Tennessee named James K. Polk, who was the point man in the House of Representatives when it came to the war against the bank, for instance, in the 1830s. His opponent was Henry Clay. Do we remember Henry Clay from the Compromise? Right, known as the Great Compromiser. Clay's a planter, a slave-owning planter like Jackson, but Clay thought a better idea was a diversified economy. He's, he's like the new, the new Alexander Hamilton, um, although he's going to live to a ripe old age, unlike Hamilton. But, uh, so it's, it's Clay versus Jackson. Clay, as I mentioned the last time we met, ran for president several times and lost every time. And he would say things like, I'd rather, I'd rather have integrity and remain, remain honest than, than become president. And this, you know, he lost. I don't know what that says, but anyhow, uh, that, that, that was the case with Clay. So Clay's leading the, the opposition. Clay's leading the opposition. It, let's take a look then at uh, territorial growth and try to, try to connect it to democracy and get into some of the background of the Mexican-American War. In 1819, the United States and, and uh, New Spain at the time had drawn borders between American and, and Spanish lands. And Spain had undisputed possession of, of California, of New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico, again, including those modern U.S. states of, of Nevada and Utah and Arizona, parts of Wyoming and Colorado. Uh, and then there was a revolution in Mexico in 1821. So now Mexico was in, had declared itself an independent republic and was governing itself. In the meanwhile, in the West, farther north, the United States and England were both laying claim to the Oregon Territory. So if you want to imagine the modern states of uh, Idaho and Washington and Oregon, but also British Columbia up to, up to the, the end of the southern panhandle of Alaska, that's, that's the Oregon Territory. And they were sharing it, which is fairly rare. That is, they jointly occupied the Oregon Territory. And if either one of them was going to no longer want to jointly occupy and draw a borderline somewhere, they had to give the other one a year's notice. The Mexicans living in New Mexico and in California depended on American trade for manufactured goods, and their governments depended on that trade for, for revenue, the Mexican officials there. There was very loose control, if any, 
between those places and, and Mexico City, where the government is. So what's, what Spain had believed, and then, and then later Mexico, believed that in, in order to control what they call their northern frontier, what becomes the, the, the U.S. Southwest, that, that's so far from the capital at Mexico, they needed to settle what they called, quote-unquote, civilized Hispanic people there. And what that basically meant was uh, uh, white Spaniards, white Mexicans, or Indians who had embraced Catholicism and, and agriculture. And so they invited immigration by anybody of European ancestry, including Americans. And all you had to do uh, if you were an American was to, uh, was to immigrate, declare yourself Catholic, and you, you could come away with a couple hundred acres of land and eventually more. That's a pretty good deal for some people who don't, who don't have land or who, who are looking for a, a new start. There was, let's get to a picture of him. There was in, in uh, the northern Mexican frontier in Texas, Lorenzo de Savala, who was, uh, de Savala was, was a physician. He was a Tejano physician, so a Mexican Tejano. In the northern frontier, uh, the Mexicans living in those places had had uh, uh, particular identities that were attached to being Mexican, but were also, also very different. Okay, so the regional identities really matter, matter here. And in California, we have the Californios, and in New Mexico, the Nuevo Mexicanos, and then in Texas, it's the Tejanos. And the Savala was a, was a Tejano physician. And by the early 1830s, he's so concerned about American immigration into the northern Mexican frontier uh, that this is what he wrote, uh, quote him. He said, an Englishman will become a Mexican in Mexico City, and a Mexican will become an Englishman in London. The same will not occur in the case of the colonies. He means the, the northern frontier. Those places will necessarily make up an entirely diverse nation, and it would be absurd to expect them to renounce their religion, their customs, and their most deeply held convictions. What will the results be, he asked? They will not be subject, they will not be able to subject themselves to the military regime and the ecclesiastical government that unfortunately have persisted in Mexican territory despite the revolutions, despite the new constitutions. They'll invoke the institutions that should be governing the country, and they'll want them to be not a lie, not an illusion, but a reality. And whenever a military chief tries to intervene in civil transactions, they will resist and they will triumph. So influence by the United States alone might alter the character of Mexican government for the better, Zavala thought. But when combined with the constant flow of American migrants into Mexico, what he called, this is his words now, quote, what he called the American habits of liberty, thrift, work, their austere religion and customs, their individual independence, their republicanism, all those would bring the triumph of liberty to Mexico. And so by 1836, there were only 30,000 Hispanics living in New Mexico, about 3,000 in California, and about 4,000 in Texas. And the governor in New Mexico, Governor uh, Manuel Armijo of New Mexico, complained to the Mexican government. He would say, look, our citizens are beset by what he called, quote, unquote, barbaric tribes, and we're left with no protection. The Nuevo Mexicanos are poor, he would say, and only survived thanks to trade with the Americans. So the Americans start looking at these sparsely populated lands and see the potential for agriculture and mining, and that's going to figure into the manifest destiny sentiment that these lands ought to just become U.S. territory, that the Americans would use the land better than the Mexicans were using it, and not only that, they were ordained by divine providence to, to do so. So I talk about Texas for a moment and these, these terms here. So the Tejanos in Texas are the Mexicans living in Texas. The Texians are the white Americans who have migrated there, bringing with them their black slaves. Then the Texans later, that's the U.S. state of Texas. So when we have the independent republic, we talk about Texians. When we have the state that becomes part of the United States, we talk about Texans. I saw a license plate the other day in town that said Texian. I assume that's kind of an old Republican Texan living, living in town here. By 1823, there were 
there were 3,000 Americans in Texas. And the next year, the, the new Mexican government started encouraging American colonization. They thought that was the best way to bring in manufactured goods. There was virtually very little governmental or trade connection with Mexico City. They gave out generous land grants to men called impresarios. In 1826, one of those impresarios led a revolt against Mexican rule. And the Tejanos and Stephen Austin, an impresario, led the fight against the rebel and put down, put down the revolt. But what happened was American allegiance of those Texians started to wane over the 1820s and in the 1830s, especially after Mexico closed the border to immigration and also outlawed slavery and forbade the further introduction of slaves. But by 1834, the number of Americans living in Texas had doubled anyway. And by 1835, there was about 1,000 Americans crossing the border into Mexico per month, into Texas. So that by 1836... There's 30,000 white Americans in Texas, 5,000 black slaves, and about 4,000 Tejanos. Meanwhile, the president in Mexico City, Santa Ana, was consolidating power and touched off a number of rebellions in about six or seven Mexican states. And Texas is one of those rebellions. Uh, but in the United States, we usually know that as the Texas Revolution. This time, Austin joined the side of the rebels. And Zavala, who was, as I said, uh, a liberal, and he's opposed to the dictatorship of Santa Ana, sided with the Americans and even helped Texas, the Texas Republic write its first constitution and served as its first interim, as its interim vice president. But Santa Ana was pretty successful at first, defeating the Americans at the, at the Alamo. And then the Americans in Texas decide to declare their independence. They elect a rebel leader, Sam Houston, as their president. And it's Houston's army that defeated Santa Ana. And by defeating him on the battlefield, they forced Santa Ana to sign a treaty recognizing the independence of the new Republic of Texas. So this is 1836. Don't confuse it with the Mexican-American War 10 years later. That's the Texas Revolution. So Texas, the Republic of Texas, was not recognized by Mexico. Mexico did not ratify the treaty that Santa Ana signed under duress after having been defeated. So this is a Republic of Texas, and at first they don't have any desire to enter the Union. They're just another republic. It's almost like Jefferson's dream of that uh, North American continent of six or seven republics all governing themselves, but not all under one, one, one government. So that's 1836 then. Back a little bit to to the territorial growth. So here's, the, here's where the, the push for territorial growth is coming from in the United States. Politically, it's coming from the Jeffersonian side. First, the Republicans, really the Democratic Republicans, who then renamed themselves the Democratic Party in 1827, and they're the Agricultural Party. And their sense, they do not have a sense like the Whigs do that wealth can be created through innovation and a division of labor. You've got to pull it out of the ground or you have to grow it. That means, that always inevitably means in an agrarian empire, that's always going to mean more land. Whether it's in the, in the southeast from the Indians or in, the, in what becomes the southwest from, from Mexico. So first had come the Louisiana Purchase, opposed by the Federalist Party. Then it comes the push for Texas annexation, which we're going to talk about in a minute. The new Whig Party, which is the inheritor of the Federalists, are going to oppose that. And then the Whig Party is going to oppose the war itself. And then they're going to oppose, for the most part, the giant cession of territory. So the Whigs, on the Hamiltonian side of things, had had a dream more of a nation state, which would consolidate itself by being smaller and building infrastructure so everyone could develop a common identity and not spreading from, not spreading from sea to shining sea. So that's the difference. So politically, the expansionists are, for the most part, in the Democratic Party, and the anti-expansionists are in the Whig Party by the 1840s. But there's, there's more to life than politics, thank God, and, and here's the nonpartisan factors. Evangelization is, is one. So we talked about anti-Catholicism and the Reformers uh, a, a little bit already, and the Evangelicals, and they're wanting to spread the, the gospel as they see it to Asia, most of the evangelical Protestants also think that the Catholics of Mexico are not Christian and they, they need the real Bible and they need the real gospel and they want to bring that to Mexico, but they can't because it's a closed, 
it's a closed country to their, their missionaries. So they have a little bit of interest in expanding territory because to them it means also expanding uh, the, the gospel. Then there's the commercial reasons. If someone in the Northeast wanted any kind of new territory at all, it would be the West Coast. If you think of the maritime and commercial interest in having access to the Pacific, and you think about the reasons the Europeans had left Europe in the first place in the 1400s, looking for routes to trade in, in China and in, and in East Asia. So the maritime trade, commerce, and finally this, this sense of, of mission, this mission that had transformed from, from just an errand, errand into the wilderness of self-government to, to spreading self-government, and maybe that's the mission. And this, this all ties together under this sense that, there was, that Americans had of themselves that there was something exceptional about them. That old city on a hill idea that we talked about with John Winthrop, that that New England colony was going to be a city on a hill and, a, and a, a, an example to the, to the world, and the world would clean up its act and have a self-government and a Christian commonwealth, etc. That's transformed by this time into the sense that the mission of the United States is just to spread Republican government, representative government. Most people nowadays would use democracy and republicanism as, as synonyms, uh, but they, re- they, they would have used the word republicanism still quite, quite a bit. And so what, what was it about the Americans that was so exceptional? The, the people promoting this rhetoric in the 18, beginning in the early 1840s, especially as Americans started considering Texas annexation, uh, talked about Anglo-Saxons. So they didn't, they didn't talk about the term white usually, although John C. Calhoun did. But they're talking more about Anglo-Saxons. What's an Anglo-Saxon? Anglo-Saxons, they said, were superior by virtue of a few things. They were superior because they were Protestant. And that was a religion of free peoples, they said. They were superior politically because of the Republican government, the representative government. So in most cases, they're not giving those later 19th century arguments for racism that are arguing biological supremacy somehow. So they're white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And Republican government was safest with them. They they had created it. They could promote it. And many of them believed that Republican government could even be found in the the pages of the Bible. And so the more Catholics immigrated to the United States, the more they tried to draw the distinction between Catholics, who they said were incapable of democratic government because they served the Pope in Rome before they served their own country, trying to draw a distinction between those Catholics and the Protestant Americans, and Republican government was safest in the hands of, of Protestants. So they're opposing the westward movement of Catholics, for instance, in Catholic immigration. So this is a, the, high, the high point of anti-Catholicism in the United States that resulted in 1836 in the burning of the Charlestown convent outside of Boston, convent and school, and then in 1844, a series of deadly riots in Philadelphia where the, Phil- the, the Pennsylvania militia even had to be called out and cannon were used to, to quell the, the rioting and the burning of Catholic churches and burning of uh, Irish Catholic neighborhoods there in Philadelphia. Two sets of riots. That's 1844. That's an election year. It's also the year that Texas annexation is being considered finally by the United States. Texas had been independent for about 10 years, and they're not sure they want to be part of the United States, but there's some Americans who would like it to be so, and some, some Texians. So that's... That's the election year in 1844. In considering Texas annexation, because the Whigs generally seem to oppose it, a Democratic journalist wrote an article and coined the term Manifest Destiny. It's Manifest Destiny is a slogan that incorporates all of that religious rhetoric and political rhetoric and mission rhetoric about, about expansion. It all becomes wrapped up in, in Manifest Destiny. So it's got that Anglo-Saxonist and anti-Catholic rhetoric embedded deep within it. It's not just about territory, in other words. It's about who's going to occupy the territory. So this is how he coined it. He said, our manifest destiny to overspread and possess the whole of the continent, which providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federated self-government entrusted to us. And he goes on to talk about our multiplying millions and all the people, but Providence is, a, this is a synonym for God. So this is how they're talking about God. Providence is God's unfolding plan 
manifest means that destiny of the United States has been made manifest. It's obvious. It would be difficult to miss it, is what they're arguing. And what the Whigs are doing then, by opposing Texas annexation, is standing in the way of the obvious God-given destiny of the United States to, to expand westward. That's, that's what this article is about. So this, this is in, uh, written in 1845, right after the, the election. But manifest destiny becomes just a handy slogan then to refer not just to westward expansion, not just to expansion of territory connected to the United States, but connected to it is this sense that somehow, to quote some of the people of the day, the, the Americans are the, the chosen people and they're going to drive the Canaanites off, off the continent, right? They're the new chosen people, chosen by providence to occupy this territory. And they have all the right stuff that's, that's needed the self-government, the Republican government, the right religion. They're the ones to do this, and the other peoples are going to shrink, shrink before this. So that's, that's manifest destiny. This is what the United States looked like in 1844, the year of this very consequential election. Uh, Texas claimed boundaries all the way up, all the way up into, into Wyoming. As far as Mexico is concerned... If there, if there was an independent republic of Texas and they hadn't recognized it, it was just this area here. But when Texas was seeking to enter the Union, these are the borders it claimed. So this is a huge disputed, disputed area in Texas. The question, all these questions of territorial expansion came to a head in the presidential election. So Texas wants to enter the Union. Should the United States annex it? There's a lot of issues. It might cause war with Mexico. Mexico had promised that it would. Mexico still claimed it as a state. Then there was the slavery question. It was very large. Well, maybe you divide it up, but then, then suddenly you have 12 pro-slavery senators instead of two. And in the meantime... In the meantime, Great Britain secretly approached Santa Ana and promised that if Mexico annexed, uh, recognized Texas independence, then Britain would ensure that Mexico could hang on to California and New Mexico. So the British, who were the biggest empire in the world at the time and getting larger, and the real enemy of the United States in the 19th century, as far as most Americans were concerned, uh, they're in the mix here too. Which brings us to the Oregon Territory. Should the U.S. press its rights to the Oregon Territory? Should they give notice and then figure out a treaty? The Democratic supporters that year coined a phrase that, as far as we know, was never uttered by James K. Polk himself, a.k.a. Young Hickory, and that was 5440 or fight. That means 54 degrees and 40 minutes latitude. 5440 or fight. The implication is the Americans want all of the Oregon Territory. How do you like that for haggling? I'm having a yard sale in another month. I'm looking forward to the haggling. It's the best part. And also selling things that I got for free. That's the other good part about yard sales, right? So 54-40, you're fine. Is that a bargaining tool? Is it haggling? Or does Polk really want the whole thing? Polk doesn't really say... The election instead really becomes a referendum on the annexation of Texas. Should the United States annex Texas or not? If you think it should, you vote for Polk. Polk talks about the re-annexation of Texas. He believed, or at least purported to believe, that Texas had been part of the Louisiana Purchase. That was an old argument the Americans had. The only difficulty was, it is, was that uh, Stephen Austin's own maps had showed that it wasn't. But other than these little, little problematic things like uh, uh, the fact that it had not, there's this sense that maybe some of it was, all of it was part of the Louisiana Purchase. So that's what he means by re-annexation. John Quincy Adams, whom the Democrats hated because he had been elected president instead of Jackson back in 1824, he's the one who had drawn up that treaty in 1819 between Mexico and the United States. So they blamed him for, for giving it away, in other words. So if you want to annex Texas, you vote for Polk. Polk's from Tennessee, known as Young Hickory. This is, Polk may be 
I might be wrong about this, but I think he may be the only president we've ever had with a mullet. <laughs> if you oppose Texas annexation or ambivalent or are ambivalent about it, you would vote for Henry Clay that year. So it's Clay versus Polk. Clay never really comes out against Texas annexation, but he never comes out in favor of it either. Polk won by less than 1%, just about 38,000 votes, and it was New York State that tipped the balance for, for Polk. He takes that as a referendum on Texas annexation, but it's a very close election. In fact, had anti-slavery purists not left the Whig Party, Clay probably would have won because New York would have swung to Polk. Maybe there's a lesson there for third-party movements. I don't know. But that's, maybe that's for another day to talk about that. Uh, so the Whig Party kind of splitting a little bit over the issue of slavery, hands the Democrats the election. Uh, three days before Polk took office in 1845, Texas entered the Union via treaty. So... While from some standpoints, Texas is part of the Mexican session, from other standpoints, it's not. It enters the Union a few days before Polk takes, takes office. But the war is certainly going to confirm Texas annexation. And it enters the Union claiming those very extensive borders. So as far as Polk is concerned, you've got to put troops all the way down to the border, which is the, the Rio Grande, not the Nueces River, farther north. So Polk's going to press that, press that claim. The president of Mexico at the time was a man named Jose Herrera, and Herrera made an attempt for a peaceful solution, and even considered the British offer once he heard of it, once he learned of it, but it's Santa Ana and other opposition parties who portrayed him, for doing so, portrayed him as weak and portrayed him as unpatriotic, willing to sell part of the, the country, willing to get rid of Texas, willing maybe to sell California to the Americans, which Americans had been trying to purchase since the 1820s in the time of Jackson. So they pushed for war with the United States over Texas annexation, even as Herrera invited a diplomat from the new Polk administration to talk about Mexican-American relations in Texas and in California. So one Mexican president invites then a diplomat to come and meet. So Polk took office in, in 1845, March of 1845. Is he really going to ask for all of Oregon? The English aren't sure. His own supporters aren't sure. In April of 1846, Polk terminated the joint occupation of Oregon. And that meant the British were either going to have to go to war for their territorial claims, because Polk claimed Oregon all the way to 5440, or they were going to have to negotiate. They're angry. They don't like Polk. They call the Americans overbearing and aggressive ruled by the whim of the mob. So that's a strike at that democratic sentiment we talked about. But they end up settling, and they settle at 49. Polk signs, signs it right at the 49th parallel, which is the current border between Canada and the United States. So he takes half, in other words. Uh, but what about the southern border? So that's April of 1846. The Polk administration had sent a man named John Slidell to talk to Herrera, as I mentioned, in late 1845. But there was political instability and volatility in Mexico, and that prevented any meet, uh, meeting from occurring. There was a coup against Herrera. There was a, mon a monarchical plot as well. Mexico went through 14 presidents between its independence and 1846, and none, none were elected. So Americans saw that political instability as a liability uh, across the, the border. So in January 1846, what Polk decided to do uh, was what Polk decided to do was, was send American troops into the disputed territory. That's January of 1846. There's Mexican troops there. Now there's American troops there, and it's really then only a matter of time till they run into each other. So he's positioned American troops there. A new Mexican president had come in, Paredes, who refused to meet with Slidell, so Polk just recalled him, and that's the end of the effort at, at diplomacy. But you've got to understand what the diplomacy is. Slidell is there to buy California outright and then negotiate a, a border. Polk's real goal, you should remember, through the whole war is really just to purchase California. 
New Mexico is going to come in the bargain between Texas and California, but he really wants California. Almost immediately, as, as Oregon negotiations calmed down, hostilities broke out. April 25th, 1846, there's a, dis- there's a clash, a small skirmish, really, uh, in the disputed territory. There between the Rio Grande and, and uh, um, the Rio Nueces. Let's get to the map here. So on this, this territory here. When Polk learned of it, about a week and a half later, a week, week and a half later, he gives a war message to Congress that says, quote, Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States, has invaded our territory, and shed American blood on American soil. So that's, that's the, the pull quotation from Polk's war mes- message. American blood on American soil. She has proclaimed hostilities have commenced. The two nations are at war. So what, what Polk is saying is, is he's going to Congress because of the Constitution, and asking them to declare war on Mexico. And he's saying, there's already a war. You just have to declare it. You just have to declare it. But there's already a war. Troops have clashed. John C. Calhoun, fellow Democrat from South Carolina, is going to lead opponents of Polk during the war. What Calhoun doesn't like is what he sees as the abuse of executive power. And his overriding concern is that the executive or the U.S. government might intervene in terms of the institution of slavery. Calhoun is from South Carolina. So that's his overriding concern. So any kind of abuse of executive power, he's nervous about. But primarily it's the Whig Party who speaks against the declaration of war, argues against it, but what they're going to do is an opposition party, so they try not to end up like the Federalists, who remember in the War of 1812, they looked treacherous by the end, the treaty looked pretty good, and the Federalist Party just kind of died because of its opposition to the war, and they don't want to look like that. They're going to be the opposition party, but they're going to tend to vote for money for the troops. Some of them are going to vote for the Declaration. They're going to argue against it, but usually vote, usually vote in favor of it. That's going to be their story during the war. More complicated than that, but uh, as it usually might be. One of those Whigs was somebody who ended up being a one-term congressman because he opposed the war. Have you ever heard of Abraham Lincoln? That seems familiar, right? Do any of you use cash? He's on the five. Have you seen this? So... Lincoln challenged Polk and said, he said, look, if, if, you allow the country, if you allow the president to invade a neighboring nation, I'm quoting him, whenever he shall deem it necessary to repel an invasion, and you, then you allow him to do so whenever he may think it's necessary. And you'll say, I don't think the Canadians are invading. He'll say, well, I think they are. So, so we're going to invade them first. So Lincoln's very concerned about that executive abuse of power as well. So he challenged Polk. He basically called Polk a liar and said, I want you to take me to the spot and show me where the American blood was spilled. And then we'll find out if it's really in Mexico or in, in Texas. So he gets this nickname Spotty Lincoln, which I guess was derogatory at the time. And so... Uh, that's, that's going to be his nickname. He's going to go back to Illinois. For all he knows, he's, he's going to be done with politics and just be a, a corporate lawyer for the railroads for a while in, in Illinois. Calhoun, as I said, was in opposition also. Calhoun's point was, it's a little skirmish. Do you have to have a whole war over it? Are we going to you know, evade the country, etc.? But it's really the, this, this skirmish becomes the pretext for the war. Polk's biggest problem politically is that both of his main generals... Zachary Taylor in the north and Winfield Scott, who's going to lead the invasion of central Mexico, both of them are Whigs. And in a democracy, it really helps to be popular if you want to be elected president. And really the only way to be that popular, at the time at least, for the Whigs, who are the minority party and have a northeast power base, is to be a general of some kind. The Whigs only ever elected two people president, and both were generals. Polk is sure one of these or both of these want to be, want to be president. Scott had actually tried for the Whig nomination in 1839 and didn't get it, so he knows Scott's a Whig. Taylor says, I'm not a Whig. I've never been a Whig. I have no interest in politics. I don't want to be president. Why would I want to be president? Who wants to be president? Can you guess which one of these two guys ran for president in 1848? 
Taylor. Yeah, Taylor, the one who said he'd never do it in a million years. And so, but Polk doesn't know this yet. So here's the challenge for Polk. Everything he sees, he sees everything through a political lens, which means he wants him to be victorious. But if they're really, really victorious, then they might use that the way Jackson had used, that kind of fame from the battlefield to get elected president. So he wants him to do the job, and then he's, he actually tries to undercut them in the field. The way the volunteer army worked is this, ar- this war is going to be fought by the regular army, which is quite small but enlarged during the war, the professional army, and then volunteers who are drawn from new volunteer companies or state militia companies, governors of the states of those militias and volunteer units, choose the colonel to go over the regiment. The men elect their own captain. So all the way up through colonel, the states determine rank in the volunteer part of the army, which means if your governor is a Whig, guess what your colonel is going to be? You've got two choices and one's wrong. (laughs) He's going to be a Whig. If your governor is a Democrat, you're going to have a Democratic colonel. Polk appointed 13 volunteer generals during the war, Every single one of them was from his party, the Democratic Party. One was his law partner, Gideon Pillow, who was a disaster. Also a disaster in the Civil War, but maybe more on that in a, in a later lecture. So he's going to have to build an army from the ground up. Let's start with Taylor. So Taylor is the one who's positioned, uh, who's positioned here. His job is supposed to be to lay a defensive line across between the northern Mexican frontier and the United States, and Polk thinks, or hopes, I should say, that Mexico will see reason and sue for peace and the world will be over and they'll get California and they'll call it a day. So that's, that's, that's the first part of the war. Taylor's opinion is that there's no way to invade Mexico from the north. It would be doomed by the great distances and by deserts. So the Army's job is just, you know, don't look too far ahead, just set up a defensive line south of the Rio Grande. And in, in northern, if you do that in northern Mexico, that would make conditions favorable for peace, Taylor thinks. So after a couple of battles, he crosses into Mexico, uh, lays siege to Matamoros, uh, where the, the Mexican troops are entrenched. But after, after negotiations, they take their arms. The Mexicans take their arms, they take their artillery, and they leave Matamoros, and, and Taylor moves in without firing a shot. His main objective was the city of Monterrey. That was strategically located, heavily fortified. Control of northern Mexico depended on Monterey, and that's where the first really big battle of the war is, is going to be. And it's going to, be, it's going to be fought house to house. It's going to be urban fighting, four days of, of, of heavy fighting in September of, of 1846. Finally, the Mexican general requests an armistice, Taylor is under orders not to sign an armistice and to just take the city and destroy the Mexican army, but he defies orders, signs an armistice. He's writing secret letters that get leaked out into the press saying things like, I don't know why we're doing this. This land is useless anyway. Uh, So this makes Polk think that he's already thinking about the 1848 election because he's criticizing Polk while he's in the field in letters that supposedly leak to the press. But whenever anything leaks, it's not really a leak. It's more like, you know, they're turning on the faucet. It's not a leak. So his army captures Monterey, but the Mexican army leaves. Taylor becomes sort of a hero back in the United States. Then in November, he moves north of a place called uh, uh, Buena Vista in Mexico and sets up his headquarters. In the meantime... In the meantime, uh, New Mexico and California had fallen quite easily to, to uh, American troops. In fact, the governor of New Mexico, as the Americans were coming, he, he got on his horse and left. He just said, it, enough, enough is enough, and they take New Mexico without firing a shot. There's, there's a revolt in New Mexico during the war. There's a revolt near Los Angeles during the war. But by the end of the summer, New Mexico and California are pretty solidly in, in American hands. So that first part of the war seems to go really well for the United States. In the meantime, Taylor's just there, and he's waiting near Buena Vista. It seems the, the Mexicans are not going to treat for peace, so, so Polk goes to Winfield Scott 
and says, you've got to draw up plans for an invasion of central Mexico. The United States is going to have to take the capital. So Scott is now going to be in charge of that invasion of central Mexico. He takes a lot of his invasion force from Taylor, which makes Taylor think Scott wants to run for president. Because now Taylor doesn't have enough troops to do anything. So they hate each other as much as they hate Polk. You with me so far? So this might not be an overseas war, but it, it does prove the, the lie in that myth that politics stops at the water's edge in wartime. It never has, and I don't know that, and I don't know that it, it ever will, but it certainly didn't in the, in the Mexican-American War. So Scott's supposed to invade central Mexico and march overland to Mexico City. He needs the troops. He takes them from, he takes them from Taylor. Taylor is very unhappy about this. But here's what happens. Um, One result, one result of the fall of that whole northern Mexican frontier is that Paredes is overthrown, the Mexican president's overthrown in another coup and replaced by Santa Ana. And then Santa Ana chooses another president only to take back the presidency from him a little while later. And in the meantime, amid amid this Mexican domestic infighting, Santa Ana faced Taylor in what became the most famous battle of the war, and it's the one you need to remember for your exam, and that's the, now you're writing, and, and that's the Battle of Buena Vista in late February of 1847. The Battle of Buena Vista. So it's, it's early February. Taylor's feeling pretty sure Santa Ana won't attack And he decides to move on his own with his mostly volunteer army of about 4,500 troops. He decides to move southward. Santa Ana gets word of this, gets intelligence of this, and advances against him with somewhere between 15 and 18,000 soldiers. He's determined to finish off Taylor's army. Skirmishes uh, uh, ensue on February 22nd. Uh, at the base of the mountains there. And then the next morning, Mexican soldiers are clashing with Americans throughout the whole day. And Taylor's only choice is to fight a a very defensive battle against a larger Mexican force. The Americans are still holding the battlefield by sunset. And Taylor's men hunker down and wait for the dawn. And it it seems obvious that they're going to be wiped out the next day. But there's a couple things that have happened. One is, by not winning the Mexican soldiers' morale have been so shattered by their inability to break the American lines, Santa Ana's army had quietly retreated during the night. So they, they leave the field. There's also political disputes and infighting back in Mexico City that Santa Ana has to go address. For Americans, this became the most famous battle of the war, and they counted a victory. And it, what the Battle of New Orleans was to Andrew Jackson in terms of his popularity and leveraging him to be able to be more famous and become president, the same thing happens with Taylor in the Battle of Buena Vista. It also made him, by the way, politically untouchable by Polk because now you can't criticize America's big war hero in the war. So that's February of 1847, the Battle of Buena Vista. The very next month is when Winfield Scott makes his amphibious landing uh, down here in, in Veracruz. And then the overland route to... To Mexico City. The U.S. Navy bombarded the city for several days before they landed. They landed in amphibious assault vehicles, incidentally built, built in the same area of Louisiana where they were later built. Similar, similar craft were later built for the D-Day invasions during World War II. They land on the coast. They wade ashore. After bombarding the city, there's not much fighting. They take Veracruz pretty easily, and Scott heads inland. Um, Santa Ana later said in his diary, he said, quote, We have no one but ourselves to blame for this disaster due to our interminable infighting. Why isn't there a larger Mexican army at Veracruz that day? Because there's three Mexican armies clashing with each other near the capital of Mexico City. So that allows the Americans to get a, to get a beachhead. And he starts marching inland in April 
and they're to Mexico City by September 14th. So you th think of this war in a couple, maybe three phases then. So you got the first phase, and that's in the north. It's in the, what, the northern frontier that the United States is going to annex at the, the end of the war. And that's pretty much wrapped up over the summer. Although there's a lot of constitutional quandaries and interesting stuff going on there, which is how does a republic engage in military government and just who's in charge in California? Two branches of the service and a third guy, John Fremont, are going to bicker over who, who's really in charge in California. And there's going to be court marshals and a, and a big mess o over that. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on in the North. And militarily speaking, it's pretty much calmed down by the end of the summer of 1846. That's the first phase. And the second really is this, this overland invasion, which goes from April to September, just a few months in 1847. But the Americans don't depart until the summer of 1848. So there's a long period of occupation and military government in Mexico cities by American military governors trying to use local civilians to govern and mayors and, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's part of the war, too, that we don't really have time in this class to, to, to go into. So Scott's plan is, is this. He's going to take the national highway on into Mexico, on into Mexico City. His first meeting with Santa Ana is the kind of battle that w would normally end any other war in these days, and that's the Battle of Cerro Gordo, at the Pass of Cerro Gordo on April 18th in 1847. So it's been about a year since the war started. But despite not having the high ground, and despite fighting in, in another country's territory, Scott's army is, is victorious. Santa Ana retreats from the field. I can't remember if this is the battle where the Americans came away with one of Santa Ana's legs or not. He had a, a false leg, a prosthetic leg, and he always carried a few extras, as you can, as you can imagine. So you, there's sometimes weird trophies in wartime. Due to atrocities, there's even weirder trophies. I don't know that we'll have time to talk about them today. Uh, but, uh, but I think it may have been Cerro Gordo, but I'm not sure. Well, from Cerro Gordo, Scott passed on to occupy the large city of Puebla, Mexico on, on May 15th. Pueblo, Me Puebla, Mexico is one of the, I think, most beautiful cities on the continent. I haven't been there in a couple decades, uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful place. And he's occupying Puebla in, in May, on May 15th in 1847. And here's the way the Army works in those days. If you sign up, if you signed up as a volunteer, a long-term enlistment to you is about six months, which is barely enough time even to train you. So in a republic, the idea was that virtuous men would sign up for military and wartime, but you wouldn't have a large standing army when it's not wartime because a large number of men under arms is not only expensive which grows and, and grows the size of the central government and, and increases its, its power and authority and, and strength and the likelihood it will abuse it. Um, but also, uh, you wouldn't have those under arms because it's, it's just the armies are, they're unrepublican places, right? You have to take orders and somebody else is telling you when to get up and what to do all the time. And the, the Americans prior to, uh, prior to the 20th century really just bristled at that sort of thing. So the idea was that it, in wartime, you would volunteer out of virtuous defense of home and hearth and there would be enough volunteers. And then after the war, you go down to a tiny army. Then if you need a big army during war, you get a big army again, then it goes down. What happens to Puebla at Puebla is most of the volunteers, those who had signed up for a year, it's done. Puebla, Scott sits in Puebla all summer long because he doesn't have enough troops to advance with. They just, they, you know, they watch the clock and they go home and, and they're done. As far as they're concerned, they've, they've done their service, they've done their duty, and that's, that's what happens in Puebla. So Scott's there for a long time. And uh, in the summer, but he leaves by by August, and the path to Mexico City is now more heavily guarded than before. Santa Ana had retreated from Cerro Gordo, had gone to Mexico City. The generals have decided. The Mexican generals have decided to give it one one last stand, and they do. And so, one option for the Americans is to send a division to flank the Mexican army at Churubusco by by 
by cutting across these lava beds. A, a not so young, a not so young engineer named uh, Robert E. Lee finds the path across these lava beds, but they're a relatively unguarded path to Mexico City because no one, it seems, had found a path through them before, at least not an invading army, clearly. Uh, so they're, they're relatively unguarded. So that's, that's one possibility uh, to, to do by marching across the lava beds, taking the small village of Contreras and then attacking from the rear, and that would split the Mexican forces, and that's, that's really the American plan to take Mexico City. So it's uh, August 19th, an American division marches across the lava beds. They've, they fought earlier in the day at Contreras. They're going to fight later in the day, the same day, the Battle of Churubusco, which turned into one of the bloodiest of the war. At Churubusco, the Americans faced a battalion called the San Patricios, or the St. Patrick's Battalion. This was a battalion composed of former American soldiers, some who had deserted before the war, some who had deserted during the war, Irish immigrants, German immigrants. St. Patrick was on, their, on their, uh, the, their flag, emblazoned on the battalion's flag. So they know that if they get caught, they're going to be, they're going to be executed as, as traitors. They had been lured with broadsides from Santa Ana that said things like, how can you attack your fellow Catholics and defend the country that's burning our churches back in the United States and burning our neighborhoods in the United States. So Santa Anna is well aware of the anti-Catholic rioting in the United States and trying to lure American soldiers uh, out of the army and, and into his army. And coming with that is going to be uh, some acreage, a good bit of land. Right? And that's, that's a pretty good lure too. So the leader of the San Patricios was from Clifton, Ireland. That's actually in the west of of Ireland in County Galway, where the Aquinas College students go every year to Tully Cross, Ireland. That's the biggest little town. I shouldn't call it the biggest little town. It's the only town really near near uh, near Tully Cross of, of any real size. There's a San Patricio Street there. There used to be a, there used to be a little monument to to John Riley. Last time I was there, it, it had, somebody had taken it. There was just a, a marble block. Uh, here, a, a, a monument to John Riley once stood, I guess. They, maybe they need a new sign. Maybe they re- replaced it since the last time I was there. But anyway, the, the San Patricios become heroic in Mexico. They become uh, seen, of course, as traitors in the United States. And when Scott catches them, he's going to hang uh, 27 of them. John Riley, who had deserted prior to hostilities, is branded with a D on his cheeks for deserter and then, and then let go. And it's thought that he continued living in Mexico, but people say they know. I don't know if anybody uh, really knows. So there's a couple good books on, on John Riley. So that's Chirabusco and Contreras on, on August 20th. Uh, rather than advance on the capital, Scott decides to offer an armistice to Santa Ana. Uh, the, the American diplomat, Trist was his name, had been in Mexico City for, for quite a while now. And he thinks, well, maybe that'll have, give peace a chance to work, give a treaty a chance to work without having to go into the city of Mexico itself. So he hopes that having the threat of the capital occupied by a foreign, foreign army, the Mexicans might negotiate a peace, making that final battle unnecessary. Santa Ana, however, is a little bit smarter than that, and he was determined to use the lull in hostilities to strengthen his position. He had lost cannon, he had lost munitions, he had lost a third of his army at Chirabusco, which reminds me of another point when Santa Ana had outsmarted the Americans. He was actually in exile in Cuba, not the last time Mexico was going to exile him. He was in exile in Cuba in the beginning of the war, and Polk comes up with this scheme uh, to talk to Santa Ana, and maybe if he can get Santa Ana back into Mexico, Santa Ana will then sell him California. So he helps Santa Ana get back into Mexico. And Santa Ana says, says I, I can't believe he really believed that. And, uh, and then he builds up an army and you know, goes to war against the Americans. But, so that's what happens during the armistice. The armistice lasts a few weeks. Negotiations break down in early September and hostilities ensue. Uh, first, the Americans take a, a, a palace-like structure overlooking Mexico City, Chapultepec, that's going to have to be taken before they enter the capital. It's on, on high ground. Then after a day-long fight on September 13th, Americans take the palace. 
Santa Anna's army uh, flees the capital. Scott's army marches triumphantly into, into Mexico City, and they raise the flag, uh, the American flag, over the National Palace of Mexico. Following two or three days of looting by mostly volunteer American troops, the occupation of Mexico City uh, begins. So that's in September of 1847. So there's going to be military government by the United States of Mexico, of, of Mexico from September 14th, the date of the taking of Mexico City, all the way until June of 1848. So this is a famous painting by Carl Neville of, of uh, Scott's army marching in, in the capital. Let me pause here for a moment and, and ask for questions before we talk about the treaty and wrap this up. And I'll get your exams and papers back to you as, as well. So questions about uh, Taylor, Scott, San Patricio's, the war... Wonderful. You know, I picked this class because you're my most talkative class. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that? Yes, Brendan? Um, wait, wait for the, wait for the, there you go. Do we know how many uh, members there were in the San Patricio's battalion? <sighs> the right question is, do I know? Right? Do I know? Uh, this is a battalion, I want to say, of about... Uh, maybe 100 to 200? I'm, I'm just guessing. I, I'm just guessing. I do know they, they fight in several battles, but they fight very hard at Churubusco because they know what's going to happen with, when they're caught. And it figures pretty, pretty solidly into the anti-Catholic rhetoric. Because you imagine the Catholics in the United States, they spend all their time talking about how patriotic they are. And then there's a, Catholic, a battalion of mostly Catholic deserters <laughs> fighting on behalf of, uh, of Mexico during, during the war. Uh, so they become they they become a, a they're well used by the uh, the anti-Catholic rhetoric though it's more complicated than just a religion issue as as you might imagine but that's just my educated guess on on how big the battalion was I'm not sure anybody would really would really know um, so there's uh, the 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 Rogues March is the the best book on that by in my opinion but um, the Rogues March. Um, good, good question about the San Patricios. In fact, uh, so so that you know, we're we're talking a death toll on the Ameri- the death toll on the Mexican side is going to be much larger because of civilian deaths, particularly in Veracruz. On the American side, you're talking about in the very low thousands, between one and one and five thousand in the whole war, and almost all of it's from what the American soldiers called the vomito or, or yellow fever. The combat deaths are very low. This is what makes the Civil War. We just wrapped up. Some, were you in the I don't know. You were in the, yeah. You were in the Civil War class, right? Last semester. So that you start talking about over a hundred thousand men clashing in one battle in the Civil War. Here we're talking about uh, uh, you know, five. The biggest battle at, at a place like Buena Vista, it's five thousand against fifteen thousand. That's just dwarfed by battles a, a couple decades later, a decade and a half later in, in the Civil War. So these are also on a much smaller, much much smaller scale uh, in, in this war. Treaty deliberations are going on all the while. Finally, on February 2nd, a treaty is signed at Guadalupe Hidalgo, near Mexico's most sacred shrine for Our Lady of Guadalupe. That's passed up north to the United States, and here's a complicated issue. Polk had already fired the man, Trist, who negotiated the peace. So Polk has to decide whether he takes the peace or not. Once the United States stood in control of these Mexican cities, Members of Polk's own Democratic Party prominently and also many members of his own cabinet are pushing him to take what they called All Mexico. So we call it the All Mexico Movement, it's called. There's this push in January and on into February to take All Mexico. And the one thing, important thing, the arrival of the treaty does is is, uh, take take the steam out of that. Because in the treaty, the United States agrees to pay Mexico $15 million, though it's not clear where that money ever ended up or if it ended up anywhere for that matter, $15 million for California, and then the Mexican session is going to become that, uh, that uh, northern Mexican frontier. 
Polk had claimed all along that this was not a war of conquest, that it was a war fought because debts were owed by Mexicans to Americans and treaty obligations were not being followed, that there was a clash on American soil. So these were all the claims of Polk. The, the anti-war folks had said this was a war to, to spread slavery. So particularly the pacifists and the abolitionists were very vocally anti-war. Some of them were anti-Catholic. That made them ambivalent. That's one of the things I did in my Missionaries of Republicanism book is talk about that. But for the most part, they're, they're against the war because they think it's going to spread slavery. So a northern congressman in Polk's own party at the beginning of the war had challenged Polk to put his money where his mouth is and, and sign into law a, a proclamation that, that any territory gained from this war would not allow slavery. And Polk won't do it. This is David Wilmot, and that becomes known as the Wilmot Proviso. Something else I think is worth writing down in your notes. The Wilmot Proviso. It never passes Congress, but it becomes famous. It becomes famous because it breaks open the slavery issue in the middle of this war. Ulysses S. Grant, who fought in this war, as said, I would have, at the time in his diary, he writes, I would have come to Mexico as a private if I could come no other way. After the Civil War, and in retrospect, he later in his memoirs called the Mexican-American War one of the most unjust wars ever waged by one nation against another. And what, what had come in between those two opinions was, you know, the young man who wants the glory on the battlefield and now somebody who's just closed out the, the Civil War with hundreds of thousands of American dead that Grant was sure uh, in large part had to do somehow with the fight over the institution of slavery. The Mexican War opens that up and it never really closes again thanks to the Wilmot Proviso. As it turns out, though, there's going to be no slavery in California, not legally anyhow, in the institution of slavery. Same in New Mexico. Texas had already been annexed, so in some ways then there's, slavery is not sent into these territories. But it does whet the appetite of some who realize if the Missouri Compromise Line stays at 3630, as we talked about last week, if it stays there, there's, really, there's, there's nowhere to go but south. So you're going to have to go farther south or into the Caribbean if you want to continue to expand slavery and create new, new slave states. The treaty, the treaty ending the war then finally is approved, ratified by the Senate in March. It's in ratified by Mexico not long after that, and the U.S. troops left in, in June. So the, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo netted the United States, California, just all to California, the current state of California. Uh, New Mexico, the ex- very expansive New Mexico we mentioned, and then also recognized the, the Texas border at the, at the Rio Grande. In return, the United States, as I said, paid Mexico $15 million, and military rule ended in June of 1848. Any questions wrapping up our our look at the Mexican-American War? In 1848, in 1848, Polk had pledged only to serve one term, and he kept his promise. So Zachary Taylor runs against one of those Democratic generals that Polk had appointed. Zachary Taylor wins. And it's going to be Zachary Taylor who's in charge at first until he died in office in 1850 of trying to figure out how to organize the Mexican session. A third of Mexico has become part of the United States. Immediately there's, there's talk of civil war, possible disunion, what will be a slave state, what won't be a slave state, how will California come in. New Mexico and Texas each claim the same territory. Will those two areas, the territory of New Mexico and the state of California, go to war? What's going to happen? So that's all going to, we'll talk about that next time. It's called the Compromise of 1850, and it's going to be Clay who comes up with the idea, but Clay also dies in, in 1850. So, but eventually there's going to be a compromise, and there's kind of a breathe, they're going to breathe a sigh of relief. The Missouri Compromise had lasted 30 years over slavery. This one maybe to last 30 years. It doesn't last very long at all, as, as it turns out, but there's at least hope at that point. So Taylor does use his battlefield fame to become president. Grant, 
Lee, a lot of the other folks who are later prominent in the Civil War on both sides have, have fought together in the Mexican-American War, but they're going to fight against each other in the Civil War about a decade and a half later. Polk died in 1849 anyway, right after becoming president. And that's, that's it. Now, if there's no other questions, we'll stop there. I'll hand back your exams and your papers. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out our podcast, First Ladies, in their own words, using material from C-SPAN's award-winning biography series, First Ladies, and source material from C-SPAN's video library. You'll listen to first spouses addressing issues important to them and the country. The program includes eight modern First Ladies, from Lady Bird Johnson to Melania Trump. First Ladies, in their own words, wherever you get your podcasts.